Yeah, that that looks pretty close. Mine looks warm and beautiful. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we're back in the studio together. Back. And that's all I got. It's been a while. <laughs> Brain's fried. Yeah, we've been kind of on recovery mode, uh, trying to recover from the craziness that we've had the last uh, month or so. Yeah, and it's uh, about to get probably two to three times busier. We get, we've got about, a, what, another 10 days, 15 days before things go nuts again. It's ramping up for me just logistically here in the office doing computer stuff and graphics and social media, but the uh, the physical craziness of actually doing things and moving and flying and all that stuff is about to get crazy here in September. Yeah, I've got to get a car ready before the Oklahoma event. I've, I, w- I legitimately went to my bank statement <laughs> to find out exactly what's on its way. I forgot. <laughs> like I bought so much for that car that I just totally spaced where I have to mentally keep tabs on what's supposed to be here and what's not. So I have a theory that uh, whenever it gets under 60 days to an event, that's when you start ordering stuff. And then about 30 days is when you start figuring out, oh, yeah, I ordered stuff, and I need to put it on the car. <laughs> and then it's just a mad dash for you to get your car done. Yeah, I, I'm not expecting it to uh, be 100% done by the time Oklahoma comes around. But nonetheless, we're still going to have fun. As long as my new, as long as the new sand tires are in, that's the big one for me. Sand tires, and then you got a bunch of other upgrades uh, going on the X3 um, regarding <laughs> performance. So which ones could not or which ones could make it on there without the rest of the stuff showing up? Possibly the big turbo. That's yeah. That, unfortunately, is the one that I want the most, but it would be probably the one that's going to take the most time. Um, but if that shows up in time and we can pull it off, we're going to give it a go. So you're taking your X3, which was traditionally a trail car, and kind of converting it over into a dune purpose-built car, correct? Yeah, it's up over 4,000 miles now, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gutting it. I'm, my goal is to shave about 300 pounds off of it, and I think I can. Um, I'm taking a substantial amount of power draw out of that car. You know, uh, my front bumper alone pulls 32 amps, and the car doesn't make 32 amps. You know, you can't generate that kind of power to put, put to push my lights. So. Not only am I saving weight, I'm making the car more efficient. So it's I'm I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's it's going to be a challenge, but I mean, we're gutting the bed, we're taking the bed off, doing the bed delete, we're doing. Uh, hopefully, like I said, hopefully the big turbo can uh, come into play before Oklahoma. Um, what else? I got some flossy stuff from TMW coming, including new doors. Um, oh man, what else? Like, man, my brain's just totally fried. Axia Alloys, I've been talking to Baja Designs all morning about moving to a light bar. And that might be, so if you can visualize my car right now, I've got the uh, headlight kit. So I'm going to consolidate that down to one S1 instead of two, instead of three. Into the spot or the flood? Into the spots. And then when I turn the brights on the, the roof rack, or I'm sorry, the, the light bar will come on as well. So I got a bone to pick with you on this one because you forever and a day argued with me about having light bars on your car and the reflections and oh, not I don't lighting like it. it and wanting to go with something down low. Yep. And uh, so you went to the headlight replacements, you went to the the shock tower bar, and now you're going back to a roof mounted light bar. So the light bar will draw somewhere around 15 to 17 amps. If you power all my lights and my whips right now, I'm up over 40. The car's stator only makes 48. And, you know, the car needs roughly 20 just to operate. So I'm way past what I'm able to actually do reliably. My light setup when it works properly right now, and it does, it puts a heck of a lot of stress on the battery. The battery can take it. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about any of that. You must have some sort of like aftermarket battery I know people. upgrade. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, it, it literally just turns night into day. And it's and it's fantastic, but it's not efficient. You know the the stator, the stator on that car I want to say is like 500 watts somewhere in there, which you know the new OEs are all moving higher. And I mean, on the pro, on the pro, I think I'm pulling about 40 amps on the roof rack bar, and it can power it all day, no problem. The X3 cannot, so we're making some adjustments. It's going to shave a lot of weight. It's going to shave a lot of weight on the bumper. I'm not a fan of light bars whatsoever. I like having the light below my eye line. It works really well. But until I get a car that can efficiently power that, it's I'm going to be kind of running uphill. 
So you're taking off uh, the roof and all that kind of stuff. Are you keeping the same cage? Keeping the same cage. I'm, ta- I'm, I'm not taking the roof off. The roof will come off when it gets wrapped, but the windshield's going to come off. The windshield by itself is every bit of 45 pounds. It's a full glass, yeah. automotive glass it's windshield. It's a beautiful windshield, but, you know, for sand... For and sand no wiper, that's been a, a well, problem. Well, big time, that we've ran big into. time, yeah. And, you know, anytime you're out on sand and any sort of fog rolls in, you're just done. You're absolutely done. Your night's over unless I just went crazy on some rain X or some, uh, uh, actually got like a wiper blade or something. It's just going to continue to be that. And I, I would much rather, this gives me an excuse to wear a helmet, <laughs> which you know <laughs> you I'm not very good about. You don't need an excuse to wear a helmet <laughs> I know. I know. You're, you know I'm not very good about that, but uh, that's, that's what we're switching to. You know, it's just going to, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping to shave 300 pounds on it. I'm hoping to add 50 horsepower and the suspension I love. I mean, dude, I I have to go through my storage unit. I have to go through my trailer and I have to go through my house to collect every part that's sitting around that needs to go on that car. And uh, I'm already starting to chip away at it. So it's going to be it's going to be a fun little project. If it can get done by the time Oklahoma runs around, we might throw that thing in the wheelie contest because <laughs> I've got uh, currently I'm running 10 blade, 15 inch uh, 31 inch tall Sandcraft destroyers. And right now, as we speak, there's a, uh, a shop in Portland that's cutting me up a set of comp, uh, comp cut to blackbirds. So how many blade? Uh, on a comp cut, I'm not sure. So maybe it's like 16. That's just a guess. But all I know is quite a bit more traction, quite a bit more traction. But the main thing is, is by this time next month, I may very well be putting in a billet diff because that's going to be the first thing to go if I'm running big power on that. Um, hopefully it holds up, but we'll see. If it can just get through this show season, the plan was to put a billet diff into it anyway to when the car's down during the winter, and uh, you know we'll have time to do that. Yeah, you're going to want to look at replacing your drive line to maybe something oh, yeah. like a solid shaft or something like that and uh, get a little more beef going on there. The RCVs are on their way too. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that car is going to definitely look a lot different. Are you going to uh, rewrap it and go with a different look? We're doing a very similar wrap because uh, I really like how it looks now, but there's this new thing that's just total Chad mode frat boy stuff and I just love it. It's, you know, those dudes. It's who used the to, glitter wrap? Well, you know, those dudes who used to pop their collar, their, the pol- polo shirt poppers. The new thing is, is you wrap the roof. Of Dude, your car been doing that on the interior. Oh, it's so dope. <laughs> yeah, we've got a splatter image where full throttles at a 45 degree angle encompassing the entire car, and then just random full throttles all the way around it blended in with all the people that help support that build. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be Chad level. It's going to be pretty sick. And I'm going to cry the first time I, I scratch it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have to be... Well, if it's just a dune car, it won't be getting scratched too hard unless you're a... It's going to get scratched very hard because I can't stay off the trails at Winchester. And the second you <laughs> run through them, you're, I mean, doors get clipped, uh, wraps you, get you clipped. tree branches through your... There is pr- no way I'm staying arms. off those trails. Those trails are <laughs> epic. That's why I go. <laughs> Oh, only time I ever think the only thing I ever remember is whenever you say something about trails at Winchester is is putting a tree through your uh, trailing arm on the driver's side. Did that happen? That was the old Ian. <laughs> that was the old. Ian. This is the new Ian. <laughs> what's what's so different about the about the new Ian? The new Ian? Yeah. I mean, much more handsome. Oh, is he? Yeah, probably yeah. like twenty pounds lighter, which works well with your camera. <laughs> hey there. So uh, hit me up chat- on TikTok. <laughs> Uh, only fans, Ian. Anyways, um, so uh, you went to uh, you did not go to UTV Takeover Virginia. I went there and, and covered that, and you actually went to Dune Fest out in Oregon. How'd that go? Uh, Dune Fest was epic. It was Border Town. It, it, the only event I've ever been to that reminded me of that place was King of Hammers because it was just. I mean, it's just this chaotic landscape of RVs. And then when the fog comes in, it almost look, reminds me of the dust out at Johnson Valley. They got a full turnout. It was epic. It uh, The riding was amazing because nobody wanted to ride. The, the dunes were just, just kind of they, blown out? Or? They were, uh, it was very dangerous. You know, there was a lot of Razorbacks that had, that had cleared out out there. And I heard a lot about people... There was a lot of wrecks on Razorbacks oh, at yeah. Winchester that oh, weekend. Yeah. yeah, I would go out there and, uh, you know, if you're riding around noon and you got some limited visibility, some stuff would sneak up on you. And I got snuck up on. Usually I can spot those G-outs. We were riding around noon or 1 o'clock during lunchtime, and I got caught by one that almost pitched me. If the car hadn't have been four-wheel drive, the front wheels wouldn't have pulled it back <laughs> down to the ground. But it... Uh, 
it was pretty epic. They, like I said, we would go out there midday somewhere around in there and there was just nobody out there. It was great. It was amazing. Like I, I've never been around the, there's this famous dune at Winchester called the Superman dune and Superman usually has anywhere from five cars to 25 cars playing around and within about a 300 yard stretch of that dune, there was nobody there. I never saw anyone out on that dune. It was crazy. And it wasn't, I mean, if you're making good power and you got good traction, well, there wasn't anything scary about it, but it's just kind of evident of how many new people that we have into this industry where they see those Razorbacks and they're really, really, you know, kind of reluctant to go out and hard charge it. And for that, I would always tell, I always tell new people, it's like, if you see tire tracks, it's usually somebody's already gone through it. So follow the tire tracks because that's going to give you your visibility. If you don't see tire tracks, you definitely have to play it safe. Well, I mean, we've we've played the tire track thing before and, and seen people flip their <laughs> flip their cars over on the ridge, but uh, yeah, but it's that was a fairly your, that fairly was, safe rule. Yeah, but that was your tire tracks, and people should know better <laughs> than to follow you. Well, I do get a little sketch sometimes, but <laughs> hey, I was on all four though. You can't blame me for not for long. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I was going slow. That was the problem. If I was going full speed, maybe I wanted to have been. Yeah. So, so you, but um, you got to go out to Virginia. I've been to Virginia once on its first year. That place is pretty dang cool, isn't it? Yeah, pretty cool, and and it only gets cooler when there's more people there. Like it's it was when you went, it was pretty small uh, gathering, especially with uh, the time frame and just the lack of knowledge in the area about the event and things like that. And uh, this year, they've really um, kind of realized that the tourism part of this impact on their community is huge, right? And so they wanted to start investing in that. And we actually met with the mayors and the city councils and uh, the Virginia Tourism Board, and everybody was there. Uh, at the event to check it out, what it was doing and what kind of people it was drawing and what, what the impact was on the community. And they all said, you know, this is uh, something important. This is something that we find value in. It's time for us to step up and support this. So not only was it a biggest the biggest event ever over in that area, but also the state itself and the county itself is now saying, we're going to invest into this because it's, recreation's it's so gonna, awesome. Recreation is going to carry that region. You yeah, know, I mean, it's all Virgin- coal- West Virginia already knows that. Yeah, I mean, it's all coal country, right? And coal, as we all know, is starting to go downward along with more efficient more op- op- more efficient operations in the coal industry as well. So there's less workers. And so there's a lot of people without work or looking for jobs, and there's not a lot of income out there. So, um, you know, tourism is something that they've had in their back pocket that they've never really fully invested in in that area. And if you look at the Southern Gap area that the takeover was at over there, that whole mountainside is a reclaimed mine. Right. So the whole top of the mountain's gone, and that is now where everybody has their buildings. So the investment was from the county, let's reclaim this land. Let's make it something usable and something interesting. And uh, so um, uh, Billy over there at the Southern Gap, he also runs an engineering firm and a bunch of other stuff. They all work together to build this awesome new recreational area out there and they built these whole new trail system the spearhead trails out there are all um you know professionally built for side by side off-roading yeah and the trails out there are so cool because it's all like you can go one way on one side of the ridge and have kind of just the way the back and forths and then you can go on the other side of the road and go up into the mountains and have straight up straight down you know 45 degree side hill and all sorts of different stuff um, and so you can get kind of your, your experience of all the different riding styles out there, you know, for trail use, um, whenever you want. Right. And, uh, what I thought was interesting is they don't allow trail riding after, after dark. So that's what? interesting. Yeah. So if they're the, the actual A red law state out there, like that. <laughs> it's not very red. It's pretty blue. Wow. Um, but the, but their, their driving hours are from sun up to sun down. And then afterwards you're not supposed to go out. And so uh, next year, I think what we're going to do is they've already said they're going to work with us about doing actual night rides, not dusk rides, and actually get out into those trails at dark, which would be really cool. So Yeah, for sure. I, I'm just kind of interested. What did you make of their version of a two-lane highway? Those roads are pretty sketch. Even They're not pretty sedan. sketch. They're sketch. <laughs> <laughs> so I was given some of the guys, uh, you know, grief because they had these, you know, 53 foot long trailers and semis and all that. And they're having to navigate these uh, twisty, short, narrow back and forth through the mountains. And they were not happy about having to do that. <laughs> I mean, some of those roads out there, you've got a two lane, what's supposed to be a two lane highway. And it's probably three to four feet wider than one lane over here. 
It, right. It's so narrow. It's such a trip too. And it's uh, just, you know, you think of like running Springs, California, or some of the roads that are around California, Southern California, how windy they are when they go through those hills. You've never seen twists and turns until you've rode out or driven out east. I, like I went through Boone County and that was just 200 miles or 100 miles or whatever it was of just twists and turns where the car probably, you know, I don't even think I went over 50 for that entire time. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, there were stories of some of the guys with trucks and trailers going through there that, you know, they showed up to the site with branches sticking off of out of different little areas on their trailers and stuff me. like that. So yeah. it was pretty funny. But uh, <clears throat> but amazing little area to ride. And uh, it's beautiful, gorgeous wherever you look. You know, if you're on top of a hill somewhere where you have a, a way to look out, it's pretty awesome. I mean, if you're not on top of something, you're, you're not going to see anything because it's just up straight around you everywhere. Right. And the Appalachian Mountains are pretty much world famous, but... It's not the type of mountain that we're used to. The mountain we're used to is eleven to 10,000 feet. The mountain's over there anywhere around 2,000, somewhere in that, if that. But they are straight up. Yeah, the, the actual pitch of the trails straight is up. what really interested me. It was For that sure. you're not just you know going up a logging road. You're actually going up loose slate and up little boulders and stuff and getting up the trail. And it's a lot more fun for me, you know, where we're used to out here in Idaho and stuff where it's more groomed. Um, these are very much not groomed and a little bit raw, uh, which is awesome. I love it. Yeah. I did notice you got to hang out with Hubert Rowland, who is yep. uh, Travis Pastrana's mechanic. Yeah. Uh, Hubert, everybody's favorite redneck showed up, um, Friday night and nitro uh, red, re- nitro redneck. <laughs> And uh, he took a, a little break from his daily to come and ride with people. So he showed up and just met at the Super ATV booth, said, hey, come ride with us. And um, you're not here to do anything, show off or prove me better than you or anything like that. It was more of, let's just go have fun riding together. For and, sure. Um, so part of his um, his tour of stuff that he does with Can-Am is, let's just go experience these trails and these places together and have a good time, make memories. It's not about showing off the car. It's not about showing off the brand. It's or about, sending it. Um, it's not about jumping huge or, you know, whatever. It's about, you know, experiencing what these things are capable of together and having a good time. Right. Which is 98% of owners. Well, I mean, that's why we buy them, right? We're right. getting out to experience and share and be, partake. And, exactly. So, and the, and the industry is just going up. I mean... I, I was on a call with, uh, you know, uh, Can-Am here this last week about their new re- releases, and they were saying that they're up, you know, new purchases are up 37%, and there's a large majority of that are women. Yeah, so that's great. The the family dynamic of off-road and UTVs is really starting to kind of hit its pace and start growing faster, and it's more... Um, I don't want to say gender neutral, but more like family, the fi- family dynamic to invest into that sport is now more open than it used to be. It's not just dad doing something crazy on the weekends. Yeah. And I don't think media really does a a mashup job of displaying the diversity that's actually in the off-road community. And it, it, you know, Can-Am recognizes it and Polaris recognizes it. Um, I, I was on a call with the, one of the, the producer from Destination Polaris, and they want to make sure that people know that this is an accessible sport to everybody. And, it, and they already know it has been an accessible, but, but just having media represent that is something that they want to invest in. Which brings me to a weird thing. You know, I already texted you about this. How is it that the biggest Polaris honk in Eastern Washington <laughs> is all dialed in with Can Am, and the biggest Can Am honk in Eastern Washington is is dialed in with Polaris? Like, how how does that work? We might have to do like one of those uh, out of body uh, what what are the Freaky Friday type things or something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird. You know, I've never been a hundred percent brand loyalist on anything. Not my cars, not my trucks. You That's know, the funniest and, thing you've ever um, said on this entire in the history of this podcast. <laughs> but uh, I have been prefer. prefer Preferential to the Polaris builds because I like the way they sit, the, the viewing angles, all that stuff. So I do have a preference to the models, not necessarily the brands per se. So like I'm super stoked on Can-Am's horsepower. I'm super stoked on Polaris's trailability. I'm super stoked on Yamaha's drivability. Like the each brand has something I love about it. Uh, there's just one that kind of over time has traditionally been the one that does everything the best across all of them for me and that was Polaris so um, even to this day I love an X3 right like an X3 will just put a big old grin on your face but at the same time I always try getting in and out of them and hate it 
So every every car has its wins and its and its losses. And um, you know, when you're a buyer looking for a car, you you have to weigh the checklist of which one has more check boxes. Yeah, when you hop into my X3, you do make a lot of dad noises. <laughs> I make dad noises, and your car makes dad noises. Yeah. <laughs> so, but even like with like uh, Hubert when we were in uh, in Virginia, uh, he gave me a ride back up from uh, Hillfest and where Hillfest is located at the event, you have to go down and around the hillside and then back up to where everything's at. So it's quite a ways and there's thousands of people down there that are all clogging up the 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 thoroughfare. So uh sitting in his car, it was funny because it was in its like factory position where it's kind of tilted back and sitting yeah. forward a little bit. And I was like, bro, I just these cars, the en- entry and exit of these cars just does not mesh with my uh, my height and body style. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um yeah, that, I mean, I love an X3. I just hate the way I have to get in and out of them and stuff like that. So it, it's just the Razors and the Polaris machines have always been very user-friendly. I'm getting in and out, so that's where I've been. And that's why I like some of the sport utility cars like Defenders and Rangers and all those different generals cars. And, generals. Yeah. Because you literally just open the door and jump in. Like, there's no process They're of getting amazing. In. Yeah. No suicide doors, you know, which suicide doors I would love to see go extinct, you know, uh, the, the the suicide doors. I, I actually, that was where my mindset was. And then I got into uh, something that had a normal swing door and I hated it. See, the problem is with a suicide door is, is nobody that hops into my passenger seat latches my door properly. So at 70 <laughs> to 80 miles an hour, they fly open and my wraps toast and my doors toast. It, it's I can, like I can clockwork. To that. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. Especially if your doors don't click together nicely, like right. easily. And, and you mean tr- like mine? <laughs> <laughs> like yours. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's a problem. And then obviously, if you ever don't get it latched and you take off, then it flings open. And I've caught my garage door, you know, the side of the door before and, and bent one back before. Like, it's just, it's an awkward decision all around, in my opinion. I understand why they did it. It seems more approachable. But in the long run, I don't feel like everybody should be doing it. I feel like it's kind of a, it was a cool idea. But in practice, we should probably all have normal doors. Yeah, the YXZ and the uh, Wildcat have normal doors and they're pretty dang handy. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there's another model I'm missing in there that's kind of... All the sport utilities are basically normal doors. Right, right. But I'm stoked you got eyes on over there. It's one of those areas that I'd love to spend about two weeks and just play within about a 200-mile It's one of those places where you're going down the highway to go where you're going, like back to the airport or whatever. And you're just saying, I want to hit that, 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 like just nonstop. Well, I flew into Charleston, West Virginia, and that's right on the Hatfield-McCoy trail system. And there's signs everywhere. Uh, Here's Trailhead for Hatfield-McCoy, and then you see it again, and you see it again, and you see it again. And I'm just going, man, I I hope maybe someday I can get out there and play on that system. That system is infamous, and it's glorious. Yeah. And they're talking about actually joining those trails in an official capacity and working together to create a bigger trail system. Yeah. So, you know, the Spearhead Trail and the, and the Hatfield Trails and all that, you know, in the near fu- near-ish future may become something bigger than it ever has been and something you can actually go out for days on versus just a day trail riding back. Right. So anyways, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, takeover was huge. We had, a, you know, as far as comparative to Oregon or, or Utah or Oklahoma or whatever, it's not huge. It's it's a smaller event, it's smaller community, all that stuff. But They pack them in there, though, man. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at the, the crowds of people that were showing up for sand drags, I mean, it just a block, a solid wall of people all the way down the track all the way at the beginning, all the way to the very end. And um, so that was pretty cool to see. Um, everybody enjoyed it. And the drag racing out there is a lot different than where you're used to, where it's like sand or, or prep track, where it's smooth and straight, maybe on a uphill a little bit. Uh, over there, it's just like raw dirt, like gnarly rocks sticking out of the ground. So as they you get speed, you're starting to get bumped around and yeah. you're starting to get squirrely and all that. And What did they have out there for horsepower? Was there some big big horsepower cars out there? Is it kind of yeah, s- I mean, stock and you would tuned? see... Uh, just the normal bolt on stuff. Um, and there was one guy out there that had a pretty hot X3, but there was none of these like big turbo cars. Like there wasn't any of these like super modifieds, unlimited class type cars. Um, I don't think the culture and the, and the, the driving scene over there really sustains that kind of horsepower. You wouldn't have a place to use it. Right. You would have nowhere to drive it. Right. Right. So, um, but there were a couple out there that definitely had them hopped up and they were probably running like a pro class setup and, uh, probably throwing down to 250. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, they could never get their full potential going because of how bumpy the race course was. So it would made it really interesting on how you selected your suspension settings, how you selected your, you know, takeoff control and all that stuff, because, 
you might grip hard and then veer right or left or whatever because of that the, ter- the terrain um and and so throwing down all your horsepower at once really didn't make sense yeah um and you had to kind of get into it so you had to maintain control on the race course so that was pretty cool to see right on um but was what was even cooler down there though i think was just um how people were really understanding the culture as it pertains to it's not just some old guy going into town on his utv it's like an actual thing a community of people and they were starting to latch on to it and really get involved with it and get excited about it and so that was pretty cool to see do you notice any new people to the sport out there or is it uh kind of hard to determine well, the, the, the demographics out there are an aging group of people. Um, and so you would see a lot of older people that you wouldn't normally see maybe out on the dunes or, or whatever. And and we, so, have, we have events on the West Coast like that too. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, grandma and grandpa do come to some of these events and stuff. But what I was noticing was there was a great uh, older generation of people out there that were totally for hanging out, having a good time, and enjoying each other's company. And then there was this brand new segment of young people that, you know, they've grown up with social media. They've grown up with kind of exposure to the outside world where traditionally in those areas, they'd be kind of localized and not see much of the outside world. And, and they're seeing, you know, some of these big power toys and these cool new cars and cool new dirt bikes and quads and all that stuff. And they're, they're super excited to get into it. So they're, they're all like at the ground level of, of new cars and new builds and new, you know, rebuilds of this and that to make it, you know, higher horsepower. So it was cool to see just the evolution of here's the older generation adopting a younger person's thing and then a young younger generation super stoked to get into it and build it from the ground up. That's cool. Yeah. If there was one thing I could say about Dune Fest, I think I mentioned to you how young that show was. Like uh I would say take over in Coos Bay, you'll see it's very common to see people between the ages of about twenty eight to fifty five. And at Dune Fest you could go down to nineteen. And they have side-by-sides. You know, I mean, 19 to 28 was probably the dominant age group at Dune Fest, which boggles my mind as to why none of them were out on the sand. Right. Yeah. And so one thing that I've noticed about Dune Fest in the past is is the, the vehicle selection tended more to be two wheels or quads or whatever, and then a, a fairly decent group of UTVs. Do you think that that's changed a little bit and that the the dirt bikes and the quads are going a little bit less now and more UTV? Or So if DuneFest had 12,000 people there and I told you that 80 to 85% was side-by-sides, that's still a ton of bikes and a ton of quads. And there was. There's tons of Banshees out there, tons of, um, I mean, I saw some of the most gorgeous old 250 Hondas I've ever seen in my life, totally restored, and they were just stunning. Um, so there was a, there's a big two-stroke culture in the Oregon sand, and it was well represented at Dune Fest. But yeah, side-by-sides were king. There's no two ways about it. Side by sides would line those events. They'd line the jump, the jump contest, the uh, the drag races. It was it was everything. I actually tried to drag my car, but uh, forgot my helmet at home. <laughs> I'm surprised you weren't dragging it through the sand on a broken a arm or something. Oh no, I was uh, I, I I was dragging I was dragging our friends. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, we we had a good time, man. They have, that place has got hit by so much wind that there's rollers out there. There's hip deep whoops out there that I can wheelie out of. And then just smash into the next one, <laughs> but but nonetheless, I, I I've I've seen whoops like that out at Winchester before, but normally I see them in Florence, and uh, it was every bit of that this year. It was there was some pretty gnarly hits out there, and it was hilarious to park like. Uh, uh, Troy from Superior Motorsports had his birthday party out there and they were on this strip that was just dead straight. So guys, it goes just sailing past it and you would just guy, watch guys just plant in the face of these whoops because they didn't have them timed right or they were just driving too fast. Yeah, it was it was a it was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you had a pretty good time there. They had, they had a concert. They had a number of different things out there. And uh, and for the most part, Winchester is bigger dunes, but smaller park, right. and uh, probably felt a little more cramped than probably the over- takeover Oregon. Yeah, our buddy Matt from UTV Obsessions out of Southern Oregon was hosting the night ride out there, and I only got to go do it once. Uh, every time the the fog would come in, it would just clap out my windshield, and I couldn't run it. But uh, we were out hitting a wheelie hit about nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night. And we're just repeating it over and over again, and the night ride comes blasting by. And a few guys are watching us out there wheeling, and they stop doing the night ride to kind of watch us do wheelies, and then they jumped in and tried a couple themselves. But towards the end of the night ride, I'm like, okay, 
they've they've gone far enough. Let's let's chase them. And I go chasing after them. And uh, Taylor from Amped Off Road was following me. And I went. I, I don't even remember it. But apparently, I went blasting by this sand car, this big LS V8 sand car, and I went flying by at almost double his speed. And Taylor goes, yeah, as soon as he went by that dude, he absolutely gunned that car trying to catch you. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to work, man. You can't go left and right like we can and side <laughs> by side. And yeah, I, I never saw him again. I just checked out. But uh, the we night ride. I love seeing those sand rails and the horsepower and what they bring rails, onto, the, onto the sand, but yeah. they just can't do what a side by side No, can. they can't turn. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can use your, you can use your turn brake and stuff like that, but in terms of just holding pace, like a lot of pace, it's your, I just don't think they're as agile, no question about it. And I've been out there at Winchester enough and I knew those lines that when I was, you know, they, they weren't going anywhere that was foreign to me on, uh, uh, the night ride. And so I knew where all the hits were on, I knew where all the G outs were. So my foot never left. It just never lifted. And, and it, that, that you've been on a night ride. There's nothing better. That's such a good time. I, I, I tell you what, if you can if you can have clear visibility of where you're going and understand the terrain and, and the capabilities of your car and yourself and, and be able to push yourself to the limits with a thousand other people, there's nothing like it. Wait till you see Oklahoma. There's no fog, there's no nothing. And the way that those dunes are set up, there's times where you can see seven, you know, five hundred yards in front of you. You right. see all those whips, you see all those lights, so you know every where every hit is, where every contour is. And, you know, some guys are just content to hold that position in that line. And I like blazing it, you know, safely, of course. Yeah. But I, I like absolutely ripping it in Oklahoma. I've never been on a night ride like Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, the little Sahara sand dunes out there are, it's not a huge dune out there to go and just rip forever. It's pretty small. So the actual train of cars has to snake back and forth fairly tight. And if you can get it like a drone shot or something of, you know, what that looks like, it's kind of like a Christmas tree out in the middle of darkness. It's just pretty cool. The dunes out in Oklahoma, though, are very, very peaky. You know, St. Anthony is peaky. Glamis is peaky. And but but the way that they're set up in Oklahoma, you don't transition the way that you do at St. At St. Anthony. It's you're just driving out into the park. You go up and over a big dune. You have to carry enough speed to clear the dune and you have to go slow enough to not launch it and land at the bottom of the dune and kill yourself. I mean, that's all those dunes are is peaky and and like the oklahoma dunes if if you go out there with the mindset that you're just going to hammer the gas you're going to you're going to get clapped there's no two ways about it so the uh the dunes have been great we went out and we did trail riding in in virginia i didn't really get to go out and do a whole lot of riding i wanted to go with hubert um but i had just came off a car wreck (laughs) so i I tried going for a few minutes and i couldn't i couldn't do it my rib my bruised ribs and my hip and everything was just where um it was a problem so i had to stop and and get out but uh but it, i can't wait to get back there and do some full send riding out there with a car and, and see what it's like so now that we've to- thoroughly pissed off all of our trail listeners with dune talk let's talk about trails you just got back from a trip on the idaho trails yeah so i uh, met a, gr- a very large group of machines and people that i've rode with in the past out in uh, uh, we met up in mccall idaho and then headed down to basically we headed up northeast to bergdorf down into Yellow Pine and then down into Pine, Idaho. So the entire loop was about 600. Uh, it was just shy of 600 miles. We, um, I think we started out with 17 cars, 14 finished, um, all three of them. One, one car had an electrical issue. The other two had fuel delivery issues, but it was a complete success. The weather was great. It was hot the first couple of days. We didn't see a lick of smoke until we hit Trinity Lakes. Um, we stayed the night in Trinity Lakes and a thunderstorm came in and it converged with a wildfire because a wildfire got kicked up as a result of that. We got off Trinity Lakes literally 10 minutes before they shut that road down and uh, got into Pine, got gas and got ourselves out of there and got ourselves back north. But yeah, it was absolutely epic. We got a little bit of everything. We got great, great weather. We got high heat. We got to swim in the lake. We got to jump in the lake, got to jump in the creek. And uh, um, as far as, I want to say there was about maybe three, four hours of misery over the course of three day, three days. You know, that's not too bad. You know, Just that, that rain or? It was rainy. It was cold. And uh, I want to say it was probably somewhere in the ballpark of about maybe 42, 45 degrees. But once we got lower elevation, once we went from about 9,000 feet down to about three, it warmed up substantially, especially around around Pine. There's so many hot springs in there. It gets very humid. And yeah, it was, it was absolutely epic. And the, the, the biggest flattery that I get when I take people on these rides is 
We got guys out there that, I mean, a couple of the dudes just hold it down out on the Oregon sand like you wouldn't believe. That's where they made their, you know, they made their car to do that. And they come out on this. They've also got a huge rock crawling background. They come out and do this and it completely changes the perspective of what they want to do with that machine. And that's the most sincere form of appreciation that I feel as a, as a guide is the stuff that I'm doing, people are loving. And that, I mean, it couldn't even get any more rewarding. Um, the thing that's happening right now is I, I have a full-time job. It is, uh, it takes up a lot of time, but when I got back and those stories started to get posted, full throttle had never been tagged as much over those, over those 72 hours, social media. I was, I would, I would literally put my phone down for 10 minutes and then pick it up and have 30 notifications where I'd been tagged on things, comments on things. And it's grown to be where we have these 17 guys, 17 cars, you know, it's multiple people. It's a lot more people than 17, but I've gotten messages where 70 more people want to come do this and I might have to do a second trip or a third trip to, to kind of satisfy it. But if there's one thing I could say about that trip though, it's very rare for a group to get along, especially that many people to get along really, really well without an incident. There was not a single incident and communication was flawless. Like when we lined up to leave, I just walked down the line of cars. I said, you're the one car, you're the two, you're the three, you're the four. When we do radio traffic, when we cross obstacles, when we hit waypoints, we're going to call that out by your car number. When I got home and they started telling those stories, they started referring to themselves by their car number. It was freaking rad. <laughs> like I was so stoked. But yeah, I'm going to have to probably do another trip, maybe even two. Next year is going to be, uh, it's going to be colder. It's going to be higher. It's going to be wetter. And I uh, can't wait. It's going to be great. So we've been on those trails before and some of my favorite views and, and right and experiences have been that yellow pine, the Trinity Lakes, the, you know, that area, right? And, you know, we get up north further and it's more stuff we're used to, so it's not as different and new to us. But what were some of your favorite spots along that way now that you've done it a few times? My favorite spot without question is there's an ascent before you get to Trinity Lakes, it yep. is brutal when it's ten when it's when it's hundred degrees outside. Like you have to keep or in the middle of the night when you don't know where you're going well, or what's too. coming up next. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean when you have uh, when when it's hundred plus degrees, like I just stare at my thermostat and my car at the hottest got up to two two oh three two oh four. Um, we were relaying traffic through the group. A couple guys got up to like two ten two fifteen and had to shut it down and let the car cool down a little bit. But when we came back through that same area and went down and let that scent, <clears throat> it it spits you out on a river. And you got a 30 mile drive, maybe 15 to 30 mile drive just down that river and it's flat and it's beautiful. And, uh, that's my favorite part that that's between Trinity lakes. And, um, uh, there's what's called the 50 inch bridge. I mean, it has a, a true designation. I just can't think of what it is. And it's not 50 inches. It's anymore. not anymore. Yeah. They took the cinder blocks out that blocked it from being 50 inches. And that, that's my favorite drive. And that ascent, that ascent, um, to get to the 50 inch bridge, cause you run, you run the river for 15 to 30 miles, whatever it is. And then you go up that big ascent. That's the gnarliest ascent. If, you know, if you're on an ascent, you have the right of way. You know, if you're descending, you have to give way. The problem is, is on that particular trail, we didn't see anybody, but there's nowhere to go. There's no for, pull off. Forget it, you know, and, uh, well, fortunately we were able to have it without an incident, but coming down the backside of that, I wasn't even driving fast, man. I did everything every single turn was an off camber and I hit one that was soft and I was in, I can't remember if I was in two wheel or four wheel drive, but when I hit it, I had nothing, no traction whatsoever. We were just sliding to, towards the bank and it would have been about a thousand foot drop off of it. We had nothing. And I called it out immediately on the radio. I'm going, guys, I lost traction, went right at that bank, got lucky. The guy behind me did a 180. Like he hit it and uh, it just spun his car completely around. He he and I were the only ones that had an incident though. Everybody else was fine. Go figure, you know. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, that that old trip was absolutely epic. The weather couldn't have been better. Yeah, some of the there's a there's a few spots on that trail that you you really do have a long haul uphill to to get to where you're going. And um, you know, if your car can handle the abuse to get up those climbs, those are some of the most epic views you're going to have in Idaho, in my opinion. Yeah. So when we went from Bergdorf to Yellow Pine. We didn't do that on the way back. We took a direct line from Yellow Pine to McCall, but you probably remember we had a, we had an ascent and it was about a hundred degrees where we ran into a bulldozer 
and there's no room for a bulldozer on it, but that guy was out there. That ascent and descent gave, gave my group the, the, the biggest amount of trouble because it's so long. You know, a lot of these ascents are about five miles long at the most. This one's every bit of that, you know, maybe even more. Um, but and I got it, it I, goes it goes a lot slower than you would think it would. Too. Oh, it's all switchbacks. You look at it, you're like, oh, that'll be fine. We can get up it no problem. We'll, we'll carry 30, 45 miles an hour or something. And then you end up going like 10, 15, the majority of the way. Yeah, I mean, there there there's sections where I'm a hundred yards from a car, a hundred yards away from a car, and he has to drive almost a half mile to get to where I'm at. You know, that's, that's that kind of switchbacks. Right. Um, but I got to tell you, man, when we did our trip, you know, there's, there was multiple trails that we took that we didn't do on our trip. Um, but one of them was the direct line from Yellow Pine to McCall. That is unreal. It's unreal. I mean, Yellow Pine's what, well, maybe 3,000, 3,200 feet, and then McCall's up over five. So you just run a river. It's 45 miles. You run a river to a final ascent, then you're in McCall. It's amazing. And, and the nice thing about that is it's mostly all grooms, easy riding, like... That one gets choppy. That that trail, the, the first part, what you're talking about, the first 30 miles are beautiful. I mean, mm-hmm. you can, if, if nobody was on it, and believe me, we did it during the Harmonica Festival, we saw more people in that 45-mile stretch than we saw on our Idaho BDR trip all in, not yeah. counting the highway. I mean, and it's crazy that out in the middle of nowhere, there's thousand people wanting to celebrate harmonicas you need to multiply that by 10 (laughs) yeah somebody told me there was ten thousand people around there i don't believe it i think it was probably closer to like three or four but when we got into yellow pine no camping whatsoever uh we did a dispersed camp on the west side of town and it worked out just fine it was great but that place was jam packed, absolutely packed. I mean, if you can picture walking into McCall, I mean, they, they closed the streets. Like you right. can't, you couldn't even get gas. You had to, you had to kind of backtrack through some side roads and they let you in one at a time, which for 17 cars, that takes a long time. <laughs> but as I've discovered, my uh, Polaris RZR Pro XP will go about 150 on a tank. Right. So when I fueled up at Bergdorf, I had enough to get all the way to McCall. And you were running, so you were running the, the Pro XP4, mm-hmm. uh, the full throttle car with, uh, were you running the 33s? Uh, no, it's got, uh, it's got Tenacity, ITP Tenacities on it, and they're amazing. Like What size though? Uh, 32s. 32s. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Like I can't, I couldn't say enough of how good that tire has been holding up so far. And I've got, on that tire, I've got about 500 to 600 miles on my X3, because I've got a set for my X3 as well. And then I've got these for the Pro, and they're fantastic. And what kind of tire pressures were you running? Uh, I run typically 12 on trail. We had guys running 20 because they knew that we were going to- 20? <laughs> yeah. Well, they knew we were going to be on pavement here and there. So they were running- tw- I mean, dude, some of the guys that were running 20 really know what they're doing, but they are down to about 10, 10 to 15 <laughs> once we would hit once we would hit pavement. Well, because like when I ran trail. the trip from Nevada to Canada, I thought I needed higher high air pressure in the tires as well. And then not realizing that the rounded profile of the tires I was running at the higher pressure, I was prematurely wearing the, the center of the tire out. So they must have had either a thicker lug or a square profile or something like that that all allowed them, them to be a little <clears throat> bit more uh, higher pressure. Yeah, all of them were running. Uh, if I remember right, one guy was running. Oh, if you give me a minute or two, I would think about it. But it's mostly like tires? a Max's Liberty style. <laughs> so it was a flat right. profile tire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you guys went, it was a, about a four day deal and, and three nights overnight. Yep. Yep. We left on a Wednesday. We were home pretty early on a Saturday. Yeah. It seemed like you guys didn't really have any major hiccups or anything like Dude, that. Dude, we ripped. We absolutely ripped. I mean, when you think about, we left, um, we being you and I in that group last year, we left Trinity Lakes about 1130 after Wes got that CB, CV boot and It's just amazing how long sometimes production can take because we took our sweet time, jumped into rivers, had a blast. We ripped from, we went from, uh, we went from Pine to Loman in under two and a half hours. Yeah. That's screaming. Yeah. When you're running a a crew trying to document and trying to, or, or fix things or whatever, any minute that you designate to something turns into five. For sure. So if you're doing five, it's turning into 25, half hour, 45 minutes. And it seems like the longer one thing takes, like if it's a 10 minute deal, it exponentially gets longer. Yeah. So you know, you remember the straight stretch south of Yellow Pine? Mm -hmm. It's very, very straight. There's like one ascent out of Yellow Pine, but predominantly you go through this long, long meadow all the way to Deadwood Reservoir. 
and visibility is excellent there. If somebody's coming, you can see it. And believe me, there were so many cars because the, the harmonica festival, we were screaming on that. Like, I want to say, I mean, there were times I was full tilt, you know, and we pull into what's called the ice hole. You heard that right. I C E ice hole campground, which is where we stayed South of yellow pine. And, uh, as soon as we pulled in there, there was no camping available, but we waited for the rest of the crew to show up. We waited for the rest of the se- uh, all 17 cars. Now, that that run is 15 to 20 miles long. I was there 45 minutes until that last car showed up, like yeah. 45 minutes. And it was so funny. Like, as soon as we pulled in, um, the guy who was riding with me, Ryan, who were, he works for Full Throttle as well, I told Ryan, I go these guys are going to be talking about that run for two, two to five years because <laughs> that's how fast it was now. And sure enough, as soon as we pulled over, I just sat back and I think I drank, I drank some water or something like that. And all anybody was talking about how, how, how much that run stoked them up. That was really cool. It's always a, a blast to be out in the middle of nowhere and have an opportunity to go full tilt and, you know, safely, safely. And, and, but the nice thing about having the group and a lead that's out far enough ahead is to call out those cars, call out those things and know when, you do have the opportunity to be safely faster than normal. Right. And, um, you know, everything with a grain of salt, you know, there's certain trails that you don't want to go faster on and you just, I won't. You just got to keep yourself on, in check. No, like you, I, I won't. Like if it's switchbacks, forget it. Every time I turn a switchback, I'm envisioning some kid riding on a quad, forget it. I'm not, you know, I even told people, I'm like, you might get a little frustrated with my pace at times, man, but if I can't see, I am not on the gas, period. You know, right? Yeah. If you if you don't like it, hang way back and wait for my radio calls. Yeah. So it, it, trail rides are always a great time. You know, just in general. But when you have somebody that can be in front and at the back of the group and and keeping communication, um, I, I I can't stress enough to anybody that doesn't have radios that does trail riding or out in the mountains or whatever. If you don't have radios, like just take the time to go experience it and understand why it's so good to have communication. Yeah, I got to give a, a big thank you to Rugged Radio on that one as well, because um, Rugged, you know, we live in a day and age where if you order it online, there's no guarantee and you're going to get it. So people are so far behind. There's so many things that are just hard to get. A, get you, it's very hard to get your hands on products right now. And um, prior to that run, five of our cars had radios and 17 went. So those other cars all ordered radios. All bought radios. Every single one of them. And, and we would get messages in the chat window. Where can I get this? Where can I get this? And I would just, I, you know, Rugged is so encompassing. Rugged has everything. Like if it, if it relates to off-roading, Rugged likely has it. And I would just send links up and everybody nice showed up with a full kit. They got a whole new product line now across the board. So it's like they there may have been things that were falling out of inventory, but it's because they were replacing it with new stuff. So now right. they got this new GMRS stuff. They got um, these new race line radios. They got a whole bunch of new product that um, are going to be better and more durable and weatherproof and all this other stuff that they didn't have before. Um, so now there's a lot more options on, on that end and they have it in, in stock for you to order. Yeah, I think their new M1 launches here pretty quick and that's a waterproof head unit. I'm, I'm Definitely interested in that, no question about it. But I also have a Baja boot that I'm going to put on my radios moving forward. I got to keep, I got to keep water out of those things because where the places I go, you, you're not going to be able to avoid water. So speaking of water, uh, that uh, run in Idaho has a water crossing in it. How'd that go for everybody? No, uh, no problem. That actual road behind that water crossing was shut down, so we just played around in the water crossing and took a direct line into Loman. You know that runs probably about 30 miles into Loman, and uh, we shaved it down to 12. Yeah, yep. but uh, always having the opportunity to, to put your machine through a little creek or river or, or whatever is always one of those moments that creates memories, right? And, um, you know, we, we approached it last year with somebody telling us, be careful, there's a, something that's going to take your car out. We didn't find that obstacle, but it was a lot of fun, and especially the stress of thinking it was there was a little more exhilarating. Yeah, I hammered my X3 through that. My, my X3, uh, I went through it twice, if I remember right. Yeah. That was a that's a cool little crossing. It's kind of an infamous crossing on that BDR. Yeah. Well, I mean, you consider how many people go on on two wheels. You know, it's probably a lot more <laughs> sketched sure. on two wheels than on four. Could be, yeah. So, anyways, uh, trail ride's always good, and um, you know, September is not going to really lend us any opportunities to go trail riding. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're going to be so flipping busy. Uh, we have Oklahoma Takeover coming up here fairly quickly. That's the first week of uh, September. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got uh, I've got Takeover. Then from Takeover, I drive straight to Vegas for the Mine Show. From Vegas, I drive to the Sand Show, and then I get to come home, and I have the whole last week of September to kind of decompress there. 
but uh, I'm going to be on trail that whole week. Uh, last week of September, I, Destination Polaris is actually coming to northern Idaho to do a shoot. And I, the one area that they want to shoot, I know, like the back of my hand, so I'm not worried about that. But the the area around Coeur d'Alene, oddly enough, I don't know it very well, you know, because if I'm going to go wheeling, I, I gotta usually go to Priest Lake. And I got to get a little bit familiar with the trail system out there. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to they're going to want to see some some train tunnels and, and some trestles and stuff like that. That is pretty epic to look at hope so there's, yeah. there's some of that out there so um there's also if you go out towards um uh, you know um uh, lake ponderay there's some good lookouts up there and, and some nice epic uh hillsides and things like that uh last year there was some fires out there so there might be some interesting things to find with some burn scars and whatnot yeah i would hope that that's all under control by the end of october Today you showed up on you brought the blue skies and clouds with you. That's I was what pretty I do, happy dude. about that. That was a nice break from all the smoke. Yeah, I was just telling you I had to replace the, the filter in my H track because it was all brown. But um, but yeah, September is gonna be pretty busy. So <clears throat> we're going to take over Oklahoma. I'm leaving <clears throat> the week, the first weekend of, of September. Labor to day. get there uh, early, and uh, and then uh, yeah. So I'm spending <laughs> Labor Day working. And then welcome um, to the club, brother. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we'll we'll have that awesome event there uh, this year. Uh, something new that we're doing. Uh, if you were at Takeover last year, you probably saw some lasers and some uh, pretty cool downtown vibes going on. Oh, you already trolled my picture of me dancing during those. <laughs> little, yeah. <laughs> Insert yeah. clip of Ian Dad yeah. dancing here. Yeah, I don't think there was. Uh, I don't think there was any alcohol in belie- involved in that, <laughs> if you believe it or not. So that downtown. So if you've never been to Takeover Oklahoma, <clears> the thing that makes Oklahoma unique is that the vendor row and all the party atmosphere and all that separate than the dunes where you go ride. So there we take over literally a horseshoe shape of downtown um, and turn that into a vendor row and, you know, food trucks and all that kind of stuff. And then you ride a couple miles down a dirt trail to get to the dunes to which then you can go ride on the dunes. So there's kind of two different locations there. And when you get to downtown, Friday night, I think 10 o'clock, we are throwing the first ever shreddy block party uh, in downtown Waynoka, Oklahoma. So we're going to take down Vendor Row into just a huge block party. We're going to have uh, Laser FX, Laser Wolf FX come out and do the laser show and bring out some pretty epic stuff there. Uh, he's bringing a DJ with him to do music and all that stuff. And then uh, basically just turn that whole thing into a big party. It's actually my birthday. So it was very nice of them to do that for my birthday. So September 10th? Uh, September 11th. And believe me, I'll be there <laughs> on September 11th that night for sure. So uh, it'll be a pretty cool uh, event, and we're looking forward to it for sure. Oh, wait till um, you see the tavern, buddy. Wait till you see the tavern behind Vendor Row. They've got something cooking going on there. I don't know if they told you or not yet. Yeah, so the Sandbar Saloon is the uh, sponsor of Vendor Row and uh, the party uh, Friday night. So they're they're hopefully bringing in um, – They're they told us they're going to be bringing in a band and some other events. And maybe they're bringing possibly, in some activities. They're bringing in activities. <laughs> that for the most part adults will want to yeah. partake in um, and uh, I heard something about short people wrestling as well um, so that'll be interesting too um, in these politically correct times man I, I don't know about that but yeah <laughs> well, well, well I heard everything goes in Oklahoma so we'll see what happens yeah, you're about to find out <laughs> yeah that, that event is a blast it really is man it's such a cool atmosphere I mean it just has this very small town vibe to it and um, if there's only, the only downfall to that event is the actual drive to the dunes because it's a five mile an hour speed limit for like two miles and right. it's annihilated it's and absolutely I've been told annihilated that in past events there's been kind of this is my this is my moment to do a public service announcement so cue public service announcement here and if you're going to participate in this event please help us out uh by not littering on that trail uh people take their sweet time consuming food and drinks and stuff along the way and then they toss it out the window um this entire event's ran by volunteers, yeah. and uh, when the event ends Saturday evening into Sunday morning, we have roughly six hours to shut down the entire event, clean everything up, pick up all the trash, wrap everything into a trailer, and head out. So please do us a favor. If you see trash on the ground, pick it up, throw it in the bag in the car, throw it away, something like that. Please don't uh, make it harder for our volunteers to put for on an sure. awesome event. Right after takeover, uh, we'll be flying back. Um, you're hitting the trail to, or hitting the road to um, an industry event for you. Yeah, a couple. And of then them. Um, right after that, midweek, 
I'm flying to California. You're driving to California for the Sandsport Super Show. Uh, first time for me. Um, you've been there a couple times, I think. Three. Yeah. And uh, so we're hoping to see a lot of cool stuff and uh, cover that for everybody and, and make some videos for that. I'll, I won't see you at that event. Trust me. That, that event is going to be your candy store. It's it's amazing. Everybody's there. Everybody right. and everything. Like they, it's called the Sand Show, but there's trail riding is well represented at that show. I mean, you're gonna see overland UTVs with rooftop tents on it. You're gonna see everything. Yeah. So if you go look at the vendor list uh, for the show, the Sandsport Super Show, it, it does encompass most of the industry. So it's not just a Sandsport show. It's it's more than that. For sure. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, maybe seeing people I haven't had a chance to see in the industry yet uh, that don't come up this far north and, and stuff, stuff like that. So you know how busy Rugged Radio can be at their booth at, at, at events. You've seen, I'm sure they're 100 times more busy at that one. They have their own aisle. It's called Rugged Row. It's huge. It's usually them, Baja Designs, uh, a few other vendors. Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't I couldn't tell you. I didn't go last year because it was canceled. But well, it wasn't canceled. It was relocated. It then canceled. canceled. Itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, rugged row is something to behold. Like the first day, the second day, there's just that. It's just elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, and. You know, I'm not going to lie. I am a little concerned. It is in Orange County, and so far, so good. Everything's going to plan. They're going to hold it open, but everybody's starting to get COVID crazy again, and hopefully that, hopefully it still goes off. Maybe they can put a couple protocols in place. I just don't want to see it be disturbed. Yeah, I think, I mean, last year, I mean, that was ultimately the downfall of the event um, was all the logistical issues they had to go through and, and how they all failed. Right. Um, and so this year, you know, do your part, be smart. Like no matter what your political views are, no matter what your views on the vaccine or whatever the case may be, there's still an, uh, a requirement on us and uh, a burden on us as the public to at least do something to allow these events to keep going. Like yeah. we, we can't be shutting things down just because we're grumpy about something else. So do your part, be safe, you know, do your distancing or whatever you need to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and I wish I had time to go. I didn't realize how far South that is in California. I thought that was a little bit further North. I just never, I'm not a geographical, like I don't see things in my head correctly. Yeah. It's just a little um, East LA. And, uh, so I'm bummed now that my flight, I, I wanted to add an extra day to my flight just so I could go taco stand hopping and beach walking and, and all that stuff. So maybe I can squeeze that in there somewhere, but, um, so right after that show, uh, you're driving back home, right? And then I'm flying back, and then two days later flying back out to that actual same place to do another industry show for um, audiovisual production. So I'm yeah. going for some professional training down there with my brother and, and a friend. Uh, Orange County? Uh, yeah, so right outside. So we're about – I'm flying back in basically into LAX and then uh, basically traveling about 30 minutes, 45 minutes away from where we were. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. So I was kind of hoping I could just stay there. And then those two extra days in the middle would just be kind of play days. You're going to come um, back home a cannon man? N no, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it should be a good time. And then that pretty much summarizes to September, um, getting back from all that. And I think I'm just about going to fall over dead once that's over. Um, dude, what a rookie. <laughs> it's my life, man. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. I, I, I live on the road. I, I, dude, I don't even know what to do if I had, if I had time home for like two to three weeks. Crazy. I don't know. You've had it this week. What's what, well, just how this you week? Up? I'm stir crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> so, uh, and then, uh, after September, you know, what is, what does the schedule look like? Is it, is it calming down? Well, the first week, of October is a destination Polaris shoot. And then from there it, uh, I'm I'm kind of debating. There's Trail Hero. I can't make Trail Hero. It, co it coincides with the Polaris shoot. Um, <clears throat> and then there is there is uh, UTV takeover in San Hollow, followed by the UTV side by side rally in San Hollow. I want to say two weeks after that, which I believe HCR, which that's the hat that you're wearing. I believe that is the. Um, they're the main title sponsor for that event. It's a totally different crowd. I kind of want to go. I'd like to go, but if, if, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But one way or the other, I got to get that pro down to Southern California, that's for sure. So an interesting topic is that traditionally Camp Razor is the end of October. Halloween. 
What do you what do you think? Do you think that there's a possibility Polaris pulls something out of the bag and just does a pop up surprise event, or do you think they just can it this year? I think they can it this year. I think they'd be advertising it already if it was going to go off, and you know if they do some sort of impromptu thing, I'm going to be stoked. That's for sure. But yeah, I'd be really surprised if it goes. Because if you look at the schedule for Glamis, basically everybody and their mom's going to be down there at the end of October. All I can tell you is nobody in the industry that I have talked to have said it's canceled. Everyone has said it's a go, but. We will see. But there's been a Polaris nope. person saying it's a go. Correct. So uh, I think everybody in the industry is just saying it, it hasn't been canceled. And maybe we don't know if that is a go. But, you know, I I, I foresee in this quote unquote new world of advertising and, and media after COVID, you know, it, it could very well possibly be a unique opportunity for someone like Polaris to say, hey, we're going to pull a guerrilla grassroots effort marketing campaign out on the dunes during one of the busiest times of the year for Glamis. And just kind of go back to our roots of how we built this industry and just do this pop-up thing that makes, you know, everybody go, holy cow. Yeah, on that Halloween weekend, I already know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be out at Moses Lake. You know, the Northwest is going to be out at Moses Lake and in droves. You know, they're going to be out there ripping and doing a Halloween thing. Everybody's going to bring their families and stuff. So it's very likely that I'm going to be out there. Um, Really looking forward to it, actually. Hopefully the X3s are ripping, but it should be. Cool. So, uh, and then after October, everything starts to settle down a little bit. We, SEMA. <laughs> um, well, if you're involved with SEMA, you know, that that's still going on, right? And I thought about going to it. I thought about adding that to the schedule, but I think Sandsport's more up my alley. Um, For this show, as, it, it definitely is, 100%. But yeah. see, there's a lot of side-by-sides at SEMA now, man. SEMA, SEMA is no longer a tuner show and a classic car show. It's an off-road show now. The funny thing is, is that Mostly UTVs off-road. have become kind of the jewelry for the builds. Like if you think about all the trucks that get built down there and everything, they usually have a UTV up on the deck or, you know, some sort of trailer set up with a UTV on it or something like that. I, I thought it was kind of funny last year when I saw a lot of the builds, they all had UTVs on parked on top to, to match them. They weren't there to ride them. They weren't there to show off to see it side by side. It was just, they looked badass, so they put them on the truck. Well, you and I have talked about it. It's like guys our age, they're not building 57 Chevys. They're building X3s, RZRs, Rangers, and Defenders. It's true. Yeah, the the car club culture has definitely shifted a bit, and um, you know the the drift car scene and the the whole cambered wheel thing and all that is still around, but it's not anywhere as big. And people it's are regional. getting more into the it's regional and it's it's niche, and and uh, we're starting to see a lot more guys interested in these off road vehicles, and I think that's cool. I'll tell you what we are seeing though is up in the Pacific Northwest, we're starting to see more pre runners, and I'm all for it. I think that's awesome. We have so much desert up here; it's ridiculous. I've noticed that we've seen a lot more fake pre-runners, which I think is hilarious. Well, I haven't seen any fake pre-runners. I, I usually got a pretty keen eye for that sort of stuff. If I see a link suspension on a truck um, with a big old set of A-arms on the front, you got my attention for sure. We're just seeing a lot of guys building like overland type pre-runners that have like a ton of weight bolted to the top of the truck and nothing underneath it to support it. <laughs> so yeah. um, that's interesting, but... Um, yeah, so we have Oklahoma coming. I'm looking forward to Sand Hollow. I think that's going to be kind of the, the icing on the cake of the year of off-road events for me. And uh, can't wait to see everybody come out. I know a lot of guys are coming out to huck and to race and to do all the cool stuff out there. So Yeah, I, the only other thing I can think of is, you know, we, got, we go out to SEMA. And then the week after SEMA, I've got an entire week blocked at, at Umqua for Winchester Bay. I know a lot of locals are going to be getting out there for that and then we're doing it again officially in february or uh, yeah in late february so i actually bought a trophy i have a trophy (laughs) showing up for just for just for clarity i'm pretty sure you bought that trophy to win the trophy (laughs) oh i'm gonna enter the contest no question about it so 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 then who judges this contest uh the northwest utv forum so (laughs) what i'm gonna have everybody do is i'm gonna have have them because what happens is guys rig it they do. They rig it. Like, if you say, here's the photo contest, everybody's going to dump all these photos into the into the thread. And the first guys always have priority, so they're going to get the most likes. And whoever gets the most likes gets the trophy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather everybody up. And I'm going to say, send me your picture right now. And once they all download, I'm going to dump them on the thread all at the same time. And I might even put their name to it. And whoever gets the most likes... As those photos are dumped at the same time, and I'm going to disable commenting because you know what's going to happen. Guys that aren't even there are going to start dumping freaking photos on there. Um, So I'm going to disable comments. The only thing you can do is like whoever wins it takes home the trophy. 
<laughs> and what's this trophy called? <laughs> it's called the 2002 Dunes and the Goons Photo Slut of the Year. <laughs> and uh, Ian's got dibs on uh, early entry into this to make sure he uh, <laughs> stacks the deck. Oh, buddy. We're, we're, <laughs> I'm going to have a tripod out there taking that freaking uh, that, that long exposure with the buggy whip going up Superman. Well, I've told you before, I want to do a cool carve photo with, with the whips running and, and make it happen. Well, so. you better get out there then, man. <laughs> Just get that, get that RZR rolling. Tell you what, that's that's the project that will never end. It's the in my RZR? garage. Yeah, just all the things that are sitting stacked up, waiting to get done. I've and, noticed. Um, the uh, the weather turned to our favor this week, so hopefully, uh, maybe later today, I'll be in there filming. So yeah, nobody. Uh, your your garage is not fun to work in when it's 105. No, I finished the garage. I insulated the garage, but there's no AC unit in the wall, nope. so uh, <laughs> that needs to. My brother, my brother, went up to me and put an AC in his garage uh, this last month. So I have to, I have to keep up with him now and get a 220 unit and tap off my dryer power and <laughs> all yeah. sorts of weird stuff to make it happen. Yeah. So. No, I'm really looking forward to the next four to five months. You know, I'm looking forward to some some time with the family finally. And, uh, you know, the, like I said, the next six to eight weeks are going to be ridiculous, but it starts to calm down right Speaking before Thanksgiving. Speaking of the family, you've been talking about buying a family UTV. What's, what's going on there? Um, it all depends on what lead times <laughs> look like, honestly. Right. I mean, when we went to Rally in the Pines, my family really fell in love with off-roads. First event they've ever been to with me. And we went all over those mountains, all over those trails, and they absolutely loved it. So, if I were buying today, and we'll see what Polaris comes to market with, if they do, um, if I were buying today, my next machine's a Max, a 72-inch Max. And uh, Now, you've had, you have the Pro 4 that you've been riding. Yep. What between that and the Max makes you decide to go to a Max because it is like another foot longer or whatever and, and shorter and, and all that? Is it just the horsepower or is it anything else? It's all the above. It's, it's horsepower. It's, um, you know, I love that Pro. I really do. But it can be really moody. You know, um, it, it will kind of every now and then just out of random, randomly it'll go into limp mode. Uh, the gauge cluster's out on it now, which is great for the resale value because it keeps all those miles <laughs> off of it. Um, so the, that the gauge cluster just won't turn on? No, no. It well, no, up. it'll it'll come on and then it'll go out like two minutes later. Um, uh, we've got to get, we've got more clutch work to do to it. We got a lot of clutch work to do to it as well. It then goes through belts, unlike any machine I've ever driven. Um, and you have an STM in that, right? Yep. Yep. And I, I don't think it's an alignment thing. I think it's a, I think it's just a setup thing. You know, I just got it. Just too I, heavy, too fast. So the last belt that blew on it, I wasn't driving it. A coworker was driving it and they f- swapped that thing out on the ocean and we put another hundred miles of uh, sand dune abuse on that belt. Well, it went out on me in Idaho uh, on that, on that run. And it shouldn't have, I had not hit one third throttle that entire day and it, it grenaded, it snapped right in half. And when I put the clutch on, I, I had, you know, I get, I put, I put marks in place on the STMs. You want to put it in this particular spot and I put marks in place, but I didn't need it. Like the way that it was set up, I didn't agree with it. I, I just did it my own thing. It's sitting a lot tighter on there now. And I, I've got to pull the cover off and make an adjustment on it. But I wouldn't be surprised now if I pull the cover, if it's in good shape. Like, I think it's in a much better position to succeed right now. But, the, like, the, for whatever reason, that car, you know, part of the reason is, too, dude, that the car is 2,400, 2,500 pounds. It's a big bear, especially when it's loaded down. But the X3, I've got, I've got 1,100 miles on the Pro, and it's been... It's been relatively reliable, but like I said, it can get moody sometimes, and it'll it'll do things like lip mode. It'll do things like uh, grenade belts, gauge cluster, this, that, and the other. I've got 4,000 miles on my X3. Nothing. You know, I broke an A-arm. That's it, which X3s are prone to do that. Fix the A-arm. You know, I think you've only gone through, like, what, three belts on that car? I went through one belt uh, doing a Brody onto pavement, and it didn't break. It still got us home. But it failed. We changed it out. Good to go. And then I had another belt on there for roughly about 2,800 miles. And I could feel it starting to fatigue out and stuff like that out on sand. Ch- changed it out. And when we inspected it, totally could tell it was due to change out. That's it. 4,000 miles. It's never yeah. got, never thrown a check engine light. It's never thrown a code. Um, I just feel like if the X3 gets a little testy with me, I got a little greater understanding of what's going on. Yeah, I would say that the from from that experience, you you have a little bit more of a um, 
consistent history with the X3 than you do with the Pro, but the Pro you've only had for a quarter amount of the time, and you've done a lot of upgrades to it. Yeah, and so. the, the suspension geometry on a Max is a 9 tenths desert car. It's a 9 tenths class 10, and, you know, suspension-wise, you can do some stuff with the Pro and make it just unbelievably well handle really well. The thing I like about the Max option is that the Fox shocks coming on that car um, have the rebound control where the where the Razors do not have that. So I think that's a huge... For someone that actually wants performance and wants to tune the car to be something, that's a huge upgrade. Right. I'll tell you one thing the Pro has on the Max far and away. Like the, the Pro's interior is vastly superior. Like you and I are both 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, <clears throat> we can sit in the back of a Pro comfortably. You can't in a Max. Forget it. Right. You know, that's that's the one gripe that I have on the Max. The, 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 pros, the pros' interior dimensions, dynamics, the way that you sit, the way that you ride, the visibility is vastly superior, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm my intention with the... Uh, with the max is to gut one of the seats and it's perpetually gone and then just kind of use that for gear storage. But I've, had, I've been having some conversations with some new OEs, product development people that want to start bringing some stuff into the UTV sphere. And I'm really excited to put, you know, I think I'm going to start putting some of those things on this car. Like I'm going to build the car to support those things. You remember how I told you that I would never put a rooftop tent on a car because it would affect handling geometry. How about a 60 pound rooftop tent? Game changer. That's the big thing about rooftops, right, is, is you put so much weight on top of your car and then you basically are ready to flip over yep. a, on a whim. So I'm, I'm having a conversation right now with an OE out of uh, Bozeman, Montana, where uh, they think that they can build a rooftop tent for a UTV that's about 60 pounds. The X3 won't even know 60 pounds up there. The thing about 60 pounds or a rooftop tent is a lot of the weight doesn't come from the chassis of the tent. It comes from the comfortable comfortable memory foam mattress and all this other stuff you put up there. So right. there has to be some compromise if you want a lightweight system that you're not going to bring, you know, a memory foam queen size mattress with you on the road. Yeah, you know, I'm... There's another company that I, I have no problem telling you who it is, is CBI Fab. CBI Fab, if you're in the Toyota business, you know who CBI is. And uh, they want to start doing... Uh, roof racks and the roof racks they want to do roof racks for stock machines though and you and i'll never have a stock machine you know is if they can build something a little more universal for aftermarket cages i think they're probably in a little bit better position to succeed but i'm really interested to see what they come up with because cbi makes everything and they are really really tough and that's a northwest company too i think they're based in idaho falls cool so um interested to see you know how that shakes out and where we cut where we where you land on that and um kind of what we build so speaking of can-ams and and all that you know they they came out this last week with all their new 2022 models all the new toys so uh if we wanted just to do a quick rundown of those a quick rundown we've been going for an hour and 10 (laughs) minutes and this was supposed to be the can-am announcement show (laughs) uh We'll we'll hit a few a couple of these things real fast and and cover them um, to a certain point, but uh, spend most of our time on what we enjoy the sport cars. Uh, but um, the the three biggest things that come out of the Can Am launch uh, was um, new new kind of updates to the X3, um, a whole new 700 cc sing- single cylinder engine that then goes into a new Defender option and a new Commander option. So if we want to talk about Defender real quick, um, the Defender came out uh, with this new option to replace the HD uh, se- uh, the HT5 uh, motor to the HD7. Um, it's a basically a 976 cc, 65 horsepower, 60 foot, p- foot pound uh, of torque on the HD9 engine, but on the HD7 engine, the new one, uh, it's 52 uh, horsepower, 41 pounds of torque. So uh, this basically replaces all their low-end models with this new 700 series uh, model line. Uh, and it comes with a new primary clutch called P-Drive, which is a roller design. So uh, this falls into all the new models, um, the 700 series, uh, the Defender, the Cam- Commander, and the new X3s. So We've talked a little bit about the belt surviving on your X3. You know, X3s have, for the most part, been an industry standard best OE primary clutch you can get. Yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, uh, Nick Leonard from Side by Side Blog was telling me that until he hit like 310 horsepower, he was on stock clutching. I've heard that from yeah, a number of tuners sure. that the primary clutch on an X3 will survive most tough. of what you throw at it. 
um, and is tunable to a certain extent that will allow you to grow pretty far until you have a very niche needed primary decision making right. uh, thing to do. So um, to me, it's really interesting that they went with this new primary clutch when they've already had such a proven awesome primary clutch. So this new clutch is a roller design. It comes from the development that went on there, uh, snowmobiles and, and all that stuff. So um, things that have technology progressed in other areas, making their way down to UTVs um, on the Can-Am side. So <clears throat> from my perspective, I'm curious to see what the perfor performance handling characteristics are, if they can still handle 300 horsepower, if they can still survive uh, the belt life things that we've talked about. And if they're more if efficient they're gonna, and put more power to the ground. Yeah. If, if the decision to switch is a, just a cost cutting move or if it's actually as good or better than what was there before. You know, that's basically the gist of the Defender. The new engine makes its way into their new models. Um, and then there's this new uh, XPS Trail Force tire that they're putting on them, uh, which is their in-house brown branded tire, which is actually, if if my memory serves me right, is made by the same people that make Obor tires. So uh, same big factory that's just making them specifically for Can-Am. So don't shoot the messenger here, but was there a Max MR X3? Prior to 2022, those were just two seaters. Yeah. I could have swore those were just two seaters. I think that's a new model, isn't it? Well, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm just looking at it right now. I'm just like totally perplexed. I mean, my memory's garbage to begin with, but I was looking at that and going, dude, dude, they didn't make an MR Max. I can look at it. Uh, I had screenshots of it. So, um, and then they moved into the Commander. Uh, so the Commander now has a 700 model option, whereas the Commander was the uh, 1000R at launch last year. Uh, they now added this new single-cylinder 700 model for a lower price entry level. So if you're looking to get an all-around awesome car at a low price point and you're not really per, you know, concerned with power and um, you know, high, high amounts of torque and all that stuff, this new uh, Commander 700 series is going to be an awesome option because you get the full Commander body. Nothing's different. It's the same comfortable setup. It has the dump bed. It has all the things of the of the commander just with a smaller motor so have you driven one yet or been in one not the new one yeah. not yet i was supposed to have one for this idaho trip and i was supposed to go with you on the idaho trip um and then that car fell through and so i wasn't able to go uh, but that would have been an, my it, first time with one correct me if i'm wrong it went to another influencer how do we feel about that Zach? <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm not sure i'm not gonna put words in anyone's mouth but the car fell through one way or the other, and I wasn't able to uh, go on the trip. So, which was good because I needed a break. I needed to do some downtime with the family. When you look at the website, the Can Am website on the on that Commander, it uh, you know it's so it's so interesting because like what what Can Am does with you, you you in particular, I mean metaphorically you or literally you. Can Am accessories are off the charts. Like they, they're just like you know, very similar to Polaris, and there's so many things that you can do within their own aftermarket catalog. And for the trips that we do, the trips that I go on and stuff, their catalog would scratch the itch of a lot of stuff that you would need on the trail. And that's the one thing that I really wanted them to kind of explore with you because you're in a position to do a really thorough review on those accessories. Like I'm just, I'm looking at a picture right now of the commander on their webpage. I mean, they got a Can-Am, they got a Can-Am and OE roof, roof rack that you can add on there. They've got bed storage. They've got a, you know, they've got winches. They've got a lot of real flossy stuff that, yeah, it might just look good, but it's also very practical. Right. And so that's the nice thing about it, right? Like if you can get into uh, an affordable side-by-side, -side, the Commander makes a lot of sense because of all the options. And they have, you know, the, the quick uh, attached storage system. And they have all the different uh, accessories you'd want to put on, whether that be a racking system, a roof system. They have a new... Um, uh, they've got two... They've got uh, an adventure rack enclosure and what they call a rear adventure rack. Two different setups there. It's very... Right. It looks like it's on a similar chassis, but... So it utilizes the, the adventure rack, the hard rack, and then they have the soft surround for it. And then you can use it in both a completely isolated storage area if you want to, like put a window down the, the, the B, C pillar and then, you know, close it off to the bed. Or you can leave it open and just have like a more of a SUV type thing where it's all open all the way to the back. I think you can actually order uh, a car. I think you can order a car from, um, let me see. No, that might not be right. I was thinking that you could order it with audio. 
the, the commander because we know we can do that on the x-rays and stuff right. but no I, they, I, they don't have the audio yeah. option on the commander yet but um but the you know that's common man like oh, for sure. on these dual sport machines they're going to start you know, the, you'll be able to get these things with JBL or Fosgate or... or uh, so the interesting ticker. thing is they came out this year with an audio roof, a, a Rocker Fosgate audio roof for the X3. And what was and the first thing I said about that? Oh. No, I said that I would break <laughs> it on my first trip to the tunes. If it has wires, I will. it will fail. <laughs> the the interesting thing driving. about it is it's an audio roof. It has the four speakers in it and all that stuff um, and the head amp and all that. So the entire roof is the in, entire audio system. Uh, but they announced an option to actually playing put, footsie with me there. Did, what, I was, what is going on? Out there? to see where you're at. <laughs> um, they actually have a, a strut option for it where you can flip the actual roof up mm-hmm. and have like party mode, DJ mode, where you are pushing your speakers towards everybody, not into your empty car. Better have a full throttle battery. You want to do that, buddy? Yeah, right. That's going to be a lot of draw on a system, and, and the OE batteries aren't aren't big enough to really last a long time with that. Yeah, so. they're not even remotely capable of it, but. You know, it, I, I haven't checked out on the state on the state or on the commander or the defender, but the Maverick, the X3 got a monster. Uh, it's got a new industry standard stator. You know, typical's 50 amp. This one's 75. Yeah, that's so the, huge. The the new one they came out with was an 850 watt uh, uh, stator yep. upgrade from where I think they were at 550 or 650. Uh, 550 on mine, 650 on the RR. Now they're up to 750, which is I mean. 75 amp is... No, they're at 850. Yeah, well, so yeah, 70... I, I go off amps at 12 volts, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, with that kind of amperage, it is... Uh, they're approaching what old older model small cars right. used to put out right. in a stator, not an alternator. And, and that's important when you're talking about charging your battery and, and keeping it maintained and, and running the car efficiently with that when you have all your accessories While on. simultaneously running your accessories, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the Commander 700 uh, series option now, uh, the XT and uh, XTP models all come with the roof standard now, which is nice. Uh, they had it like it came with the two-seaters, but the four-seaters didn't have it. And they came out with the XT. How many episodes ago was it when I was like, this Commander Max XTP is awesome, or XTP is awesome, but I wish they had a four door, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, that was like the first thing we talked about when they announced the Commander last year. And then Can Am went pow, and then Can Am was like, "Oh, Zach's talking about a four. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that's why they did it, Zach. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were listening to the podcast. I'm pretty yeah. sure. So they came out with the Commander Max XTP four seater, and I think that car is the car that everybody should uh, should buy. I think that's an amazing car, and I, th- I can't wait to try one out. Dude, I totally agree with you. I think I think that and the General are going to be so freaking popular over the next five years. I, I, just a no brainer, dude. They scratch off so many, th- check off so many things. Yeah. So the Commander Max XTP comes with the winch and the upgraded tires and 15 inch bead locks and the Fox shocks, which I think is like the key. The key upgrade everybody overlooks with these these entry level sport utility cars, if you can get away from the the no no name s- standard sprung suspension and go to the Fox podium shocks like on the XTP, your ride hand your ride handling characteristics and your comfort level is going to be way better than the other cars. It'll it'll almost feel like a completely different car. Well, if there's one thing that, and I'm I'm just double checking before I overstep my bounds here and speak out of turn here, yeah, I, I verified it now. There's one thing that I would love to see on the commander that the defender has as an enclosure, you know, like when I was coming down uh, Trinity Lakes in a monsoon, I was <laughs> and I was freezing cold. I was thinking to myself, man, a, a defender freaking HVAC type thing would be amazing, or a Ranger North Star. But yeah. uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the, you know, 2022, to, or I'm sorry, 2023, 2024, that you get in it. You get, does Polaris doesn't do uh, a general enclosure. Like, they've got a very sealed cab, but it's not like a heater and AC like the North They don't Star. have the HVAC system for it's the general, common. I'm pretty sure. But they do, I have seen people take the, the Defend, or the... Um, the Ranger HVAC systems, the upgrades that you can buy for those, and put them in Generals and Razors. That's cool. So, yeah. uh, for the nice, for the most part, those are, you know, a block with some hose tubing to go to some vents, and so you can pretty much put those in anything as long as you know how to install them and put them into your cooling system. So, um, so anyways, the Commander Max XTP car of the year so far for me. That is a great option for a lot of people, and that uh, comes in just under twenty five thousand. So. Um, I don't know how I feel about you in this no turbo life. <laughs> well, I mean, I started off at life with a 16 turbo, right? And it wasn't like a monster turbo setup like the new cars are. Yeah, my YXE had beat it. 
but <laughs> but the uh, the interesting thing about going to the 1000 as I was very grumpy about it I didn't I wasn't happy about losing my turbo but actually having the the 1000 for a couple of years um, really changed my mind especially in the trail ride that we do most of the time even though it sounds like we just ride dunes all the time we mostly are trail guys and the thousand on the trail really that's perfect doesn't have yeah. any flaws with it just i mean i'm i'm never going to pass up an opportunity to hound you so <laughs> but no i i just yeah i i definitely think that that's you know i i firmly believe that they're probably going to sell more it was very similar to polaris polaris sells more rangers and they sell anything else and i'm sure can is going to be in a similar boat where they're selling more defenders and selling more uh, commanders but I mean, there isn't anything in the Can-Am lineup of side by sides right now that doesn't blow me away. They're awesome. Yeah, they're same they're, with Polaris though too. The uh, the nice thing about the Commander is that the 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 frame system and everything is all set up to do a full enclosure like you want. They just have to come in, come out with it and, and and start marketing it. So yeah. Uh, so beyond that, um, you know, the 700 series Commander does have uh, the new P drive primary clutch on it. Um, and then let's see if I'm missing anything here. Uh, the big thing that they were pushing, um, with this relaunch is that with this new P drive and, and 700 series and all this stuff is to re- to reduce the break in period. So they're, they're actually advertising these as, in there is no break in period. There is no, you know, 500 miles of slow going belts, you know, temperature changing and all this other stuff. They're just saying, go have fun. So that's nice. Also, the 700 is going to put off a lot less heat, so that's going to be another thing if you're into uh, the car out in the warm conditions. You don't want it to overheat or be uncomfortable. That's a nice thing. Um, and they came out with a Commander XMR. So there's a new XMR option. Uh, it comes with the X Edition seats, comes with the 1,000R motor, uh, comes with the extended mud guards and 4,500-pound winch, and it comes out with these new XPS, uh, these new can branded XPS Swamp Force mud tires, which I think are really nice. Um, they have a nice lug pattern on them, and I think that uh, a lot of people are going to enjoy those stock tires until they're ready to upgrade or uh, build bigger their car. So I think that's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, and then the, the, the one thing that the XMR comes with is a synthetic winch line where I didn't realize that the other, the other models come with a steel winch line. So if you're into winching a lot, uh, take that into consideration as well. The XMR only comes in camo too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It only comes in uh, a mossy oak, uh, what do they call it? Mossy oak breakup, uh, country camo. Which, if you chew Copenhagen and drive a big jacked up Chevy truck, that's like right up your alley. But yeah, I think they should have came out with a bright colored, like the lime green that they had on their their Mavericks or whatever. I think those those hot colors sell them. Oh, I loved I loved the murder hornet look of the old XMR Defender. Like I thought that Defender that was yellow and black was just slick. And I'm not a yellow fan at all, but it looked really cool. So moving on to the Power Sports uh, cars, they came out with the X3 Refresh, and uh, no big changes here outside of a lot of changes on the frame. So uh, the first thing that they came out with was advertising a new tune on the ECU, and that the car is being advertised now at 200 horsepower. 32s. So 32s, they they now have the option. Well, so all the all the Turbo RR cars come with carnivores now. And then the uh, RS car comes with 32-inch carnivores. Uh, still 14-inch wheels, so no wins there for the community. Everybody wanted 15-inch wheels to get uh, so they can stop scraping rocks through their wheel wells. But, um, but yeah, the, uh, they're all 14-inch still. Turbo RRs all come with carnivores, and uh, the, the RS comes with 32s. Um, all the, the Turbo R series is now no longer, so there is no Can-Am maverick x3 turbo r there's either just the turbo or the turbo rr and they upped the horsepower on the turbo series uh to or yeah to 120 horsepower so the 172 172 172 horsepower turbo rr spit it out exists turbo r and now it's only the turbo r DS or the Turbo RR is at 200 horsepower. So they've they've reduced their options, but they've standardized across the board. So that's nice. But the big thing here uh, that everybody's going to be excited about is just the upgrades to the chassis and the durability of the car. So they came out with uh, what they're calling a, a fully reinforced chassis. 
but uh, the key takeaways here are that they upgraded the wall thickness of the chassis by uh, just under 30%. So I asked them directly about that. I was like, what, what did your wall thickness go from and to? And so they went from a 1.4 millimeter to a 1.8 millimeter uh, th thickness on their chassis wall. And if you look at the graphics on this, it's mostly the entire surrounding um, frame around the cab and then some of the lower structure. So uh, some nice reinforcements there uh, that everybody will like. And then the biggest upgrades were in the rear end, which is, you know, no guy's going to argue with some upgrades in the rear end, but um, the toe link on the knuckle is now double shear. So, like, you have experience with taking out a rear knuckle. I don't have experience. I, I have experience with uh, letting somebody drive my car <laughs> and taking it out. Uh, but if you if you throw your car into something hard, like a rock or a wall or something, um, a lot of times you'll bend or strip out or waller out the toe link on your knuckle. That is now a double shear knuckle joint, and the... Um, the toe linkage from the knuckle to the radius point on the frame has been changed a little bit because of it. And the lower link has also been upgraded a bit. Uh, some of the questions we got about that is if it's compatible, backwards compatible with previous generations uh, to upgrade like an 18, 19, 20, whatever. Um, asked them directly on that. And they said that uh, you'd have to upgrade the, the, uh, the rear radius plate and the knuckle and the radius rods. So all that would have to be upgraded and the trailing arm. So that whole section would have to be upgraded. You just said $5,000. <laughs> That's true. You could go with aftermarket for that point. Um, let's go down the list here. Uh, newer, uh, the, they reinforced the front A arms, the lower arms that you bent out on uh, the Washington Trail. Um, they made them thicker, a little bit stronger. Um, I asked them directly, I go, did you... Did you just redesign it to clear the frame on a 72-inch model to no longer taco? And uh, they said they'd get back to me. So that's a hard no. <laughs> yeah, that, probably not. <laughs> um, I still think, you know, I, I, I appreciate that they upgraded that, and that might work really well for some pre some people. But it's it's the first it's the first mod for me. Literally the first mod. I'll outside of all the safety lower, gear, but onto I mean, the performance upgrades. I mean, honestly, at the time that the cage is getting done, I'm going to be doing lower, lower A-arms. And so uh, we talked about the tires, the horsepower. And so the reinforcements, um, one thing that they also reinforced was that rear plate where the radius arms all connect to the chassis. There's that flat spot where you have the six holes for the radius arms. That went from, uh, what did they say? Anyways, they made it a lot thicker. It's like three times thicker. So a lot of guys have a problem where the radius rods over time will waller out the holes and then it no longer becomes a solid link. It's, all, it's a wobbly link. And as we know, if it moves, okay, so it went from 1.4 millimeters to 3.2. So that's more than uh, enough to keep that solid now. So all those reinforcement plates that you can buy aftermarket um, may not be needed for you anymore, um, but something to be excited about there. Yeah, I actually have a set sitting on my uh, countertop at home right now for like shock tower brace and stuff like that. I've got a it's, it sounds like stuff that they've addressed. A lot of the, the stuff cars. they've addressed. Yeah. Now, you just said shock tower brace. <clears throat> they did not change that drastically. So they may have upgraded the wall thickness of certain parts up there, but the actual design. And that'll help. And it'll help, but the actual design of having that missing front brace is still there. Right. So you're, you're still going to want to have shock tower braces if you're if you're throwing your car into stuff. Um and then it comes with a new P-Drive. So all the new X3s come with a new P-Drive primary clutch, and that old clutch is gone. Uh, we asked if that primary uh, P-Drive is compatible with previous models, and they said that it's compatible with the 21 model, but it's not compatible with any of the other ones based off of engine tuning, calibration, um, and a bunch of other, uh, other factors with the car. Um, so I asked about the secondary uh, clutch. So they've talked all this stuff about replacing this primary clutch with a P-Drive. Uh, I asked if the secondary clutch was any different on the actual trans. And uh, they said that uh, while it's it's largely the same, um, it, there's been a few tweaks mostly in the tuning, in the in the transmission and stuff like that. So uh, most of the changes on the, on the primary drive, the chassis reinforcement, and then the tuning on the ECU to make it 200 horsepower. So, um, yeah, I mean, really, there's not been a lot more changes on the X3 models. Um, they just made everything better, though. I they mean, just made it better. Yeah, I mean. They just address a lot of the, the friction points that people have had. Yeah, I mean, if 
if you knew going into 2022 that they weren't going to come out with a new car, you got to be really happy with what they did to the existing car. Yeah, if you're getting into a new X3 now, uh, I mean, you win. Best one they've ever so, built. Yep. Yeah, it's the best car they've ever built, and it's probably last longer than any of the other Very cars. Very likely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, outside of that, not a whole lot going on with their product release, uh, but... Uh, you got to kind of like the price as well, man. I mean, you can get a you can get a 200 horsepower RR right now, X3 Max RS. It doesn't come with a roof. You know, it, it's got a few things where they shaved off shaved off some price points. So those things start at like 26.7, which, I mean... My 2019 X3 RC two seater started out at 28. You know that's a that's a lot of car for 26 on a max. You know, and then you can go all the way up to 33,000 on a on a Smart Shock. So on a, on a, so here's an interesting thing one. that I just realized. <clears throat> so let's talk about four seaters because you're looking at maybe getting a four seater, right? right? Maverick X3 Max uh, DS Turbo RR. So it's a 64 inch wide car, and I'm thinking in this direction just because you may be looking at upgrading the suspension and components and all that stuff, right? So if you're getting into a car where you're planning on replacing a lot of the components in the car, you want to buy the lower end so you're not paying for stuff you're just going to be getting rid of, right? You can get the X3 Max DS Turbo RR with 200 horsepower, 64 inch wide um, for 25 grand. That's the new MSRP on that, right? If we go back to the Commander and look at the new XTP four-seater, um, that car is 25 grand. So now you have two completely different styles of car, one drastically more powered than the other, one a lot more seating position and, and capabilities difference. You're looking at a Commander Max XTP, Max Maverick X3, where is your head at? Is it all purely on the platform and, and the capability, or is it in horsepower and the future possibilities of upgrades? Uh, it is all about the sport machine for me. No question about it. Like, when I go to the mountains, I want the absolute most toughest and most capable wheeler made on the market. So that's your Turbo S four-seater, that's your Pro four-seater, and that's your X3 four-seater. Like, I think that those are the cars that are most able right out of the box to go tackle the most difficult obstacles in America. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy that the Commander is now the same price as the DS. That that its capabilities um, might not match with the price points there. So, well, did you also notice that uh, you know Can Am sixty four inch RC car, uh, their sixty four inch rock car, crawler car was always one hundred twenty horsepower. They make that in two hundred now. That's right. pretty dang cool. I think that's awesome because yeah. like when you got your RC, I was like, wow, that's a lot of value that you just got by getting the RC, right? Like you're getting a good amount of horsepower, you're getting a pretty capable car, and then you're getting this upgraded uh, front differential sure. and all this other stuff. Well, they also upgraded the entire Maverick line to be the upgraded diff and and all that. So you're no longer having to choose, you know, you're not having to do a lot of investigative work to figure out which car to buy. It's more like, okay, which style car do I want? I want that one, then to buy it. It's right. not it's not ha- complicated anymore, which is nice. Um. So yeah, there's there's the RC uh, version of the X3 that now comes with the Turbo RR package and the 200 horsepower. They all now come with the front diff and all that, so that's great. I just think it's a huge win for the consumer that uh, a lot of some of these models are a thousand bucks more, two thousand bucks more now than they used to be. We all knew the prices were going up this year, especially with manufacturing problems that they've had across the board. Um, but I think that the upgrades that you're getting for that investment is well worth it. So if you're buying an X3, would you get the Smart Shock? I would absolutely get the Smart Shock. Yeah, I don't know if I will. I I'll, I would. Uh, but that's I, just me saying that because I would then treat those shocks like with the shock therapy setup or something like that where you can put in, they have a package where you can get the full tune on the shocks, you get the porting, you get the, the spring rates, and you can also get the QS3 upgrade. So not only are you getting Smart Shocks, you're also getting the valving package, the spring package, and three variants of all of that tuning. So your your variants go from like, you know, whatever it is, 14 settings to 16 settings, whatever, to that times three. So I think that's really cool. But if I was replacing everything and the shocks didn't matter, then no, I would just get the cheapest one I could. So anyways, um, yeah, Maverick X, or uh, the Can-Am launch, pretty cool. They uh, Did you see their new pontoon boats? No. Dude. Can't be, be not can am BRP uh, Sidu right Sidu Skidu oh, one man. of one of them 
I am not an, a watercraft person. What am I doing here? Let me get this right. Sidu, yeah. So, BRP Sidu, they came out with a new uh, Sidu Switch, which is a pontoon boat, but it's more like a... Um, it's more like a UTV version of a, a pontoon boat where things are made of plastic. They're modular. You can move the the driver deck. You can move like to different spots on the boat. Uh, it steers with handlebars instead of a steering wheel. Has a thro- has a, a throttle just like a like a Sidu, like a Skidoo um, Wave Runner or whatever. So it's pretty cool. I think that's cool. If 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 you're in the market for a watercraft, check those out. If you get a pontoon boat before you get your next side by side, dude, we're gonna have beef. I, I'm not a person to buy a watercraft before a side by side. I so. like, watercraft's on my radar, man, but I always tell people it's like congratulate me on life if you see me with a boat because it's on the list, but it's at the very bottom. And if I have a watercraft, I have every you toy have everything else I have already. Every toy known to man. The thing about watercraft is you can only use them for so many months, right? UTV you can drive all year round. Pretty much. So anyways, this podcast has gone way too long. And uh, excited about the new cars for everybody looking to buy a new car. Uh, obviously, they didn't release a monster that we were all hoping for. Um, but I think that uh, this upgrade progression shows that they're looking to push the envelope a little bit further. Yeah, as far as a new platform car, I think that was, you know, the quote unquote monster that everybody was kind of, uh, we love candy. You know, and just seeing new stuff, new stuff to think about, uh, having decisions to make, it gets everybody excited, you know, and, uh, you know, Polaris has got, Polaris has got the Ranger, the General, and the uh, RZR Pro, and, uh, you know, Can-Am kind of stuck with platforms that they had. It, you know, very weird 18 months. I'm really happy with what everybody did with with what both of those OEs did. Now, if uh, Yamaha would come to the table with 72 inches and 10,000 horsepower, I think uh, everybody would be really happy. And like, if the Japanese OEs really get after it in the next 18 months or something like that, we'll have we'll have an interesting decision to make. I mean, rumor has it, Cowie's got a monster coming. You know, like we might be able to see it as soon as uh, early early summer. You know, I, I've, I've heard that from a few different sources. Haven't heard a single thing about Yamaha or Honda. So, yeah, which is unfortunate because they're great little platforms that they just they just need tweaking and they need some upgrades, some some life cycle changes um, to make them competitive. In, yeah. in my opinion, in the pure sport. Area. I, I drove a four seater Talon for about maybe 15 to 20 miles uh, out of takeover and it was it was pretty dang solid. So. Yeah. Cool. You've yeah. been replaced with a change battery. I sign. know. My, so, camera, my camera's out. So that's yeah. our signal to end this episode. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us on this. I know it's been a little bit all over the place and we weren't super uh, structured on our conversation, but it's always a good time to get back in the studio and record uh, the podcast. So we're looking forward to these shows coming up. Uh, UTVtakeover.com if you want to look into that. Uh, Sandsport Super Show. Uh, I think that's their website.com um, or Google it. Um, and then we have, uh, like you said, you're going to SEMA. Uh, SEMA is what SEMA is. So go find that there you can find us on spotify google apple Podcasts, all the places you can find us on youtube for the video version and uh, we appreciate you joining us for another episode until the next time peace